Welcome to Master in Music. My name is Petronella Turin and I am a Swedish cellist and host of this podcast. I am actually also a mental trainer. I started this podcast for myself, for my students and for everyone out there who loves music. Because this is the podcast for everyone interested in music. I wanted to inspire people who do music, who are musicians themselves or work around musicians. So... I try to make an interview that is a little bit like a behind the scene interview. So I start with an introduction and then comes the concept part where we listen to the artist or musician's music. And then after this, the interview starts. And then I ask all the questions that I can think about, uh, all the things that I want to know more about. And things that I think that this artist is doing very well. So, for example, it can be how to practice very good, how to get a job, how to get into schools, how to win auditions. Uh, everything is of interest. And how to create music, how to compose music. I have people who are composers coming to the podcast telling about composing. I have instrument builders, I have folk musicians, I have conductors, rock conductors. And yeah, I try to keep it quite broad. We've only been going on for one year, so we have still time to develop and we have so many musicians out there that I want to interview. And if you have any ideas of who you would like to listen to in this podcast, just write me a message on Facebook, Instagram, email, send me a letter and tell who you want to listen to and what questions you want answered. And I will try to obey. Well, today I've been putting in a little best of, yeah, even everything is best of, but I've been taking a little goodie bag from the previous year, from episodes that... I think is very inspiring and I try to make a little teaser for you with some uh, in, yeah some of the interviews and a little part from them and if you are more interested in listening listening to the whole interview you should visit www.masterinmusic.com and there you can find all the episodes and all the information about the different artists and you can also of course find the Lovely podcast on Acast, on Spotify, iTunes. Yeah, we try to keep it covered so everyone can listen to the podcast. So it should be where podcast exists. Don't worry. But let's start with opera. Why not? Opera is fantastic. So I have a dramatic soprano for you. It's Susanne Schimak. She's a fantastic uh, opera singer and a fantastic teacher in the Conservatorium Maastricht. And yeah... She is just incredible and a very, very inspiring person. She has played the role of Electra uh, very recently to when I interview her. So we talk a little bit about that in the big interview. And here in the small interview, we are going to jump into a part where she talks about how it is to be a singer, how it is physically and how it is mentally to be a singer or, or a musician. So we're going to listen a little bit to that. So yeah. you, you really, you know, it's, it, it, it claims being a singer, being a performer. It's musical theater. So you need to be a, an actor. You need to be an actress. You need to be able to move on stage. The dancing, you know, if you have a director who knows what he's doing, he will spare you the dancing. Mm -hmm. But um, in general, you really... So you have to break it down to a kind of a regime of really being in touch with yourself physically and mentally. But I think that's the same for instrumentalists. Yeah, isn't like it? for me, I experience that is the difference that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the small things. Yes, it's not anymore because everyone is skilled. Yeah. Everyone is really True. good at playing. Everyone is very musicality. So what is the different is actually the shapes. True. The mental training is so important these yeah. days. I really discovered that because so much in the moment. Yeah. Can you control yourself today? Can you can you order success mm -hmm. and stuff like this? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, because it's hard. The market is hard. And, and also harder. resilience. You know, it's like the new word, but it's so true that we go on audition, and there's a lot of uh, rejection. That's the nature of the business. Yeah. People like it or they don't like it. It doesn't necessarily mean that the quality of your audition was bad, but maybe you're just not what they're looking for. 
So there is a lot of resistance, rejection. Mm. <laughs> and it's, it, you know, the longer you're in it, you would think that, well, you get used to it. You don't. No. You really need to get over the fact that it's not you personally, it's the product that is being rejected. And therefore, you need to build up resilience. That is something that we also need to teach our students. That think of, if I, I think the best comparison for a singer would be a sportsman, like running a marathon. Depending on the repertoire, some of us run, you know, 100 meters. And when you sing Wagner and Strauss and all that stuff, it's like really marathon. Yeah. So you have to know that it's not only the running. It's also maybe you go swimming one day. You have a mental coach. Mm -hmm. You have a, a massage therapist. You have a, a physiotherapist. You yeah. have, we don't have that. So we need to be all that in one person. And that makes it really difficult at times yeah and, sorry just one more sentence because you said you know we put the singers in a box with all the love with, that we have and i know the box and i'm also in it and i like to be in it mm -hmm. but i know that sometimes people say about us that we're difficult and some singers are difficult but i think sometimes that is just the expression of helplessness and of insecurity mm -hmm. they're really trying and they feel like they're you know caught in in some box And then this is what happens. So we need to also pass this on to our students. Everybody struggles yeah. all the time. Even the professionals who have been in the profession for a very long time. It's okay to struggle and you have to embrace it and that will free you. The sun is awesome. So let's jump into a part where she's talking about memory and practicing. The memory and also the, also the, the brain and also the muscle memory. Yeah. Because I don't know if you agree, but you know, you... If you practice the wrong way, you are training a wrong muscle memory. Yeah. And it's very difficult to get out of those habits. Yeah. It's easy to get into a wrong routine, but it's very difficult to resolve it. So this is this is also something to really consider. And I, th I think this is something that we can only, again, for the students. I had this American teacher because, you know, I, I studied in, in America. And she would always say, if it ain't feel right, it probably ain't right. Mm. And... That still, I still quote her because there's a lot of truth in it. You think being a hardworking musician and being a hardworking artist includes irritation, and it does. And it includes disappointment, and it does. But it shouldn't include pain. There shouldn't be physical pain in it. You can be tired. You can be exhausted. You can, you know, be all hungry, all that. But if your muscles, your throat or your hands or whatever start hurting, it's Your body is telling you something. It's time to question yourself. Is this what I'm doing? The right thing? Am I with the right teacher? Am I in the right profession? All these, because it is a life decision. And I don't know, I have, so far I have not yet met anybody who went into it and gave it up and kind of was able to really release it. I know people who have gone into different professions, but they always sort of keep coming back and looking for contact and, you know, yeah. That's the beauty and that's also the tragedy of it. Thank you so much, Susan, for sharing those advices to us. Now we're going to go and listen to a man called Erik Dieteren. He's Dutch and he is managing a band called Slagere van Kampen here in the Netherlands, which is a drummer band who is uh, really, really, really famous and very awesome on the drum. He's also managing the music school here in uh, Maastricht called Cumulus and he's working with the museum as well. He's uh, working a lot, this man. And here we're going to jump into a part where he tells us a little bit about his story, how he started out as a pianist and then started his own orchestra when he was very young. And he's also telling us a little bit about what's really important when you start a big company or a big enterprise. And when you work with a lot of people, what he thinks is the best advice for managing a lot of people and making them happy and wanting to work with you. Part of my life already when I was a child. Later on, I uh, developed interest in uh, popular music, pop music more than classical. So next to uh, studying uh, classical music uh, at the mu uh, music school, I also did a year uh, of uh, uh, pop music because I maybe wanted to go to the conservatorium in, in Hilversum. Uh, but then I decided, no, I'm not a musician in my heart. Uh, I like it, but it's not something for my profession. I'm going to study psychology. 
So I went to Tilburg, and at the same time, my brother, Guido Dietre, is a well-known violinist, uh, asked me, do you want to perform just like in the past when we were a, were a child, uh, piano and violin, uh, but then in a more popular way? No, we did, and it became a big success uh, next to our uh, study. Uh, he played at the moment also with uh, André Rieu in his orchestra, and then we became the, the idea to, to start by ourselves a big orchestra, but then uh, classical and pop music uh, together. Uh, so then we started a big uh, orchestra, professional orchestra. Uh, How old are you when you start this orchestra? Ooh, I was mid-20, mid somewhere. Just very young to start an orchestra. Yeah, yeah, very young. Yeah, but we did. It's about, I think it's, I'm now 74. It's 21 or 22 th- two years uh, ago. We started the orchestra, so then I came back in music uh, again. But then it, it was kind of naturally that Guido was artistic leader of our company and I did all the rest. So I made uh, did the production, the marketing, finance, contracts, everything what had to do with running a company. But how, also, uh, how did you know what to do? Because you were studying psychology so yeah we we had the luck that two good people came in our company it was Gerard Rutte he was a former director from a record company Sony he believed in us and started working uh, with us and we had Volker Langhout at the moment he worked with André Rieu very much as a booker booking agency and I learned very much from uh, those people I, I was a kind of management team with them together uh, the first year of, of our company so I learned uh, leading a company from them so uh, what did you learn exactly like how do you lead a company yeah that's difficult the first place uh, your product has to be okay so you have to listen to the artistic uh, people in your company very good you have to listen to your clients very good you have to develop your own ideas and you have to make one big strong idea from that and then leading a company in my opinion is setting good goals uh, to achieve uh, sticking to that but not too strictly you have to move to left to the right if it is possible and when you make appointments to people uh, your own people the orchestra uh, the marketing finance you always have to do what you promise always that's uh, for me the key from uh, managing a company always keep your promises Thank you so much, Erik Dietren. Now we're going to continue with a man called Peter Powell, or Peter Power, as I like to call him. He's uh, in business. He started out as a guitar player, but somehow on the road he became a businessman. And he's really, really good when it comes to music and business combined because of his background as a musician himself. Uh, he's a musician by education and businessman by accident. And we are going to dive into a really, really good uh, part here when he's telling us how to impress a concert venue, how to get them interested, how to sell a concert and uh, what they are looking for in an artist when they book them for a theater, for example, or a festival. So listen carefully to Peter. So if I wanted to sell a concert, for example, Mm -hmm. what would you uh, give me as an can you do an example? I'm sure you sold a lot of concerts. Yeah. You also bought them when you were working in Just Maastricht. I mm-hmm. guess you were buying a lot of artists to come here to Maastricht and play. Like, um, what was the best presentation you saw? Like, what did they do? So you're talking about an artist selling to a concert producer? Yeah, yeah. Or an That's artist talking to audiences? No, to the producer who makes the concert. Um, that's a little bit different than, than selling to an audience. In the end... The concert producer has to like what you're doing, of course, Mm -hmm. but what they want to know is how many tickets are you going to sell? Yeah. Because sure, they're getting funding, but every ticket they don't sell is money that leaves their pocket. So Mm. it's um, more risk for them. The way we would do it at Jasper Strecht is, for the most part, it would be artists that we were already interested in and had an Mm. eye on, which means like you have to have people, you have to be active. Yeah. You have to be out there. You have to be doing things. We have to be able to find you. Then we'd look at that artist that'd be interested in booking and we'd look at their social, their social media mm-hmm. and their YouTube views and all of this stuff. Yeah. And that gives us a sense of, okay, how many people are interested in this person? And also we'd look at their promotion material, what they have. Like if you don't have good pictures, we can't sell that concert no matter mm-hmm. how good your music is because I got to post stuff on social media to promote it. I think we got to make a poster, mm. you know? And then on the basis of that, we'd maybe talk to other organizations that had booked the artist before and mm, see how yeah. did the ticket sales go and then we'd make the choice sometimes we get emails from artists proposing concerts and then what we want to know is 
very clearly, like give us the information very clearly. Who are you? What's the interesting thing that you're doing? So do you have a CD release? Do you have a really cool new project? Is there something uh, interesting? How is that going to, like, how are you going to sell that? Yeah. Why is that an interesting thing for us to buy? And then last of all, what gives you credibility? A lot of the time, and this drives me nuts, a lot of the time bios begin with blah, 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 started playing this instrument at the age of three. And then they studied with this person and had masterclasses with this person and won this competition. Mm. We don't care. No. Because everybody started playing at the age of three nowadays. Yeah. Everybody's had lessons with fantastic, amazing people and everybody's won competitions. Yeah. So unless you've won like an incredible mind, like if you, if you won the Thelonious Monk competition in the yeah. jazz world, if you won the Chopin competition in the classical world, that's good to know. Yeah. Throw that out there. Uh, but for the rest, that's something you can mention later on to build credibility. What you want to grab people with is this is the really amazing thing that I'm doing. This mm -hmm. is why you should be excited about me. And here comes the part where we are diving into the actual marketing. Expensive can you be when you sell tickets? Depends on how good you are. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I'm going to actually jump back to that process. So the, mm. the, the way that process goes is it starts a lot sooner than that when you want to think about marketing. So you start with who am I, uh, you know, the, the yeah. brand thing, and then you go to who am I selling to? Yeah. Uh, this is where music, especially classical musicians get it wrong a lot. So they think, okay, the way I put together a concert program is I pick music that I like. Mm. Well, yeah, but no, because maybe people don't want to listen to that. So if you know who you're trying to sell to and who you're trying to bring in, you need to ask the question, okay, what can I give them that I enjoy, but that they're going to be prepared to pay for? And some things they'll pay for more and some things less. And with concert series, you see this quite often where they'll sometimes book artists that they know just aren't going to sell that well because they love them. But for the most part, the season is full of people that they think are going to sell. Mm. And sure, they like them as well, but there might also be artists in there that they don't like. Yeah. But it, it sells tickets. So you have to do the same thing where you say, okay, what do I need to play? What concept do I need to put around my concert program? Uh, how do I brand it so that the people I'm trying to sell this to are going to be interested in it? This thing of like, I'm playing music by Stravinsky and Tchaikovsky and blah, blah, blah. Yes, well, so is everyone. Mm. That doesn't make it interesting. Give me a theme. Give me something to connect it and mm. something to make it interesting. Once you have that identified, you know who you're selling it to, you can think, where do I reach those people? So for instance, Facebook is becoming less and less relevant for younger audiences. For, for 35, 30 to 35 upwards, it's still quite interesting. There's still quite a lot of activity. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to reach younger audiences, Instagram is by far the best way to go for now as far as bang for your buck. So then you choose your channels based on that. And then what you want to do is not think about, I'm going to post one image and my concert is promoted. You want to think about a steady stream of content that you put out there, a series of uh, posts mm -hmm. that get people interested and engaged and involved. And then you want to have rat, you want to have ads running on an ongoing basis. Yeah. And you can have different kinds of ads as well, depending on how much time you have to set them up. But you definitely want to have at least one ad that's kind of permanently running. And how much do you think you should uh, spend on ads? Like, what is a reasonable pricing? It really depends. Standard marketing budget for an organization is 10 to 20% of their total operating budget. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a total budget for your concert, then 10 to 20% of that should be uh, going towards your marketing efforts. Thank you, Peter from Canada. Amazing. And Peter is also working with Team Academy, which is a different kind of business school. So now we're going to uh, change the style a little bit and go to Fena Ograjensik. She's a Dutch uh, singer who was educated in Juilliard and she has a unique project going on here in uh, Limburg. She has a foundation called Music Young for Old which is a foundation that is providing music to elderly home and hospitals and also for companies and so, but it's mostly for older generations who cannot go to a concert hall. And she has this um, deal, so the students from conservatoriums can play for the old people and she's organizing the concerts. So it's a very, very nice uh, co-pro project that she has going on where young people can play concerts and old people can listen to concerts. So it's a really, really nice concept. And here, where we are jumping into the episode, is where we are talking about how music can affect your brain and affect you in a positive uh, direction when you are old and, yeah, 
listening to music. So let's listen to Fena. With the brain and all people, they can... Um, like, my experience is that when I play a, a song for them that they know, mm -hmm. uh, people who is really, like, lost uh, in their dementia or yeah. Alzheimer's, they mm -hmm. can come back. Yes. And they, they know the text of the, the, this song, but yeah. they don't know the names of their children. Yes, it's amazing, because music is in one of our earliest parts of our brain so it's very everything we put in there musically it will still be there and also uh, people with dementia will recognize speed or high notes low notes and yeah it's a lot of research is being done at the moment because a lot of people suffer from this disease and it's you know it's so dark to say but either you die of cancer or you will get dementia and then you die yeah. so it's it's getting more and more important for everybody to to do something with that and music is a big one i um i saw an article where they said that musician um it's very rare that musicians get dementia or alzheimer's like alzheimer's is something that you have genetic but the, the dementia there was not a lot they never found a conductor for example with Alzheimer's uh, uh -huh. with dementia so um in one way we could cure dementia if we play for the dement people with dementia we mm -hmm. could cure dementia because if we play for people with it we can cure ourselves with the music with music young out we're doing yeah. research now for three years because my main goal is I, I don't have the money to put a research project like that on, but I want to show that if you would listen to a classical concert every week or every night, then you wouldn't need a pill or something. You yeah. know, that's my dream. And what you just say, I really believe in it, that it, it can be such a medicine, literally, for people. And imagine what a, what a difference it would be in healthcare costs also, yeah. if we could at least not cure it, but... Yeah. have a benefit in that way. So maybe there is someone out there with yeah, yes. some foundation who wants to support this project. We can yes. always lay out a little yeah. hinge that we are here. But what you just said about uh, mu musicians not having dementia, that is also a very interesting topic, I think, for yeah. a research project. Yeah, and uh, it's also like they did like a lot of TED Talks about how music is like a workout for the brain. It really Definitely. activates all the brain and it's really like scientific proven. Yeah. So I don't know why people don't use it. <laughs> Come on, science. Come yes. on, society. You know, I think in the Netherlands the problem is that um, we are a country of trader, uh, uh, you know, uh, trade. Yeah. Not traitors, but traders. Yeah. And everything we sell has to give us money in our hand. Yeah. And uh, it is our job as musicians and uh, people in culture to show that it can we can profit from music and culture, but it's not always the money straight into the hand. Yeah, and that's this is a sustainable a yeah. normal way. Thank you, Fana. So interesting. And we are coming to the last person that we're going to listen to. Don't forget that you can listen to all the episodes uh, on. Uh, all the platforms where podcasts are or you can go to www.marsaymusic.com and you will find all the episodes there and you can listen to the full version and learn even more. So uh, we're going to meet a man called Morten Rylund and he's a violinist and a conductor. He comes from Denmark and he's leading a fantastic, amazing youth orchestra called Danish National Youth Ensemble. It's an amazing orchestra where young people play as good as professional or even better sometimes, which is incredible and maybe even impossible, you would say. But uh, we're going to jump into a place where he explains for us what he thinks is important when he works as a conductor and how he, his views of leading an orchestra and his thoughts about that. A string orchestra and, and even sometimes with winds, but this core of strings, I've worked with that for nearly 30 years. Mm -hmm. Not the same orchestra, but, but kind of built the same, the same idea of orchestral building has been continued for a very long time. Uh, and I've had this amazing opportunity to, to, to try out things, not only thinking them, but doing them. Yeah. Uh, and always improving. And I mean, even even now that I think Dune has a very high level of playing, always, every day, it's not a thing that I, it's not a thing that I have decided to do. It's just a matter of how my, how my mind works. That that after all rehearsals, I'll start questioning things. You just it's just happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, why this? How this? Do 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 do. Even even questioning 
my own methods that are really like kind of the core of the ensemble. I would, if I one day realized this is total crap, I should do something else, I'll change it. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, I guess, that, that curious approach to, to art, to life, to music mm. is really, I think, important. And it's, but it's also what makes you, what can make you, uh, of course, sometimes insecure. Mm. Because it's much, much easier to just know how it is. And I think for many people that meet me, I'm, I'm seeing me now, mm. uh, especially with Dune or, I mean, in, in that area, working with strings, I guess they will think that he knows everything or he knows everything how it should be. But actually the secret to, to that, the secret, like, in, like, with, <laughs> like with all other also big questions in life, the secret to... To, to big faith is to also have access to, to, to big doubt, actually, yeah. and to, to be willing to, to question things. And we are also going to listen a little bit to now what he seeks in the orchestra when he's uh, working with them. You should have kind of take the leadership of your, of your uh, instrumental yeah. playing. Yeah. yeah. And the good thing, I mean, if everybody now, I don't know how much I said so actually when you played Fitzmanna, but now everybody coming through Dune, and it's a lot of people, they will hear, please play mistakes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I even sometimes, and people the first hearing for the th first time believe I'm insane, when I say that if you are almost playing a mistake, please play louder. Because... First of all, we need to to get rid of, of of this disease that I really believe is is so so much in our uh, uh, maybe even the society as a whole, but at least in the classical musical environment, is this fear of making mistakes. And it's not if you hear tune, you will not hear an, a concert with a lot of mistakes. Actually, no. it's the opposite. But but it's there's it's just a total. Uh, other, it's it's just another state of mind if you are avo avoiding mistakes or if you're building up what you want to do yeah. and to build up what you want to do you need to free yourself you need to have a free muscle a free mind and there's nothing that you learn so much from than a really really well played mistake yeah, yeah? and you your, your mind will immediately say oh i don't want to do that i do this instead but if you if you're tensed if you hold back things mm. It will be always like that, and and that's another thing I just do all yeah. the time. I but want this. I want this total presence. Yeah. I want focus. I want uh, energy, and then also I want it to be relaxed at the yeah. same time. And that's I'm really, really, really happy when people say that's what they actually experience, and and I think the efficiency of that is actually really amazing sometimes even myself i'm kind of of uh, shocked how fast things can move forward when you and, and it's and that's and you could say uh, when you mentioned being the conductor i call it leadership i think that good leadership is to to get the best out of yourself and then buy that from others yeah so i need to be in a state of mind and then even i'm asking again the I'm I'm answering the question about why why running why uh, why winter bathing why mm -hmm. meditating. Mm -hmm. Of course, itself it it makes a lot of sense. But when we talk about music, it clears my mind. It makes me the best version of me, yeah. which makes it possible to make you the best best version of you if you are in the orchestra at yeah. this time. And and I think it's a very important thing to to realize that. If I'm just a little bit stressed, it will, it will immediately be felt yeah. by the orchestra, or maybe not felt, but I, what I'll do will just it will just decrease the quality of everything, and that's it's, then it's time for a break. So that was all of the di different sneak peeks that I wanted to show you for now, and thank you so much for listening. It means a lot that you are here supporting us and I'm looking forward to see you and hear from you on uh, masteringmusic.com and on the websites and Facebook page and Instagrams and God knows where. You can always find me. I'm a Swedish cellist, Patronella Turin, and this is Mastering Music. 
in Mastery Music we have this thing. So when you listen to Mastery Music, you screenshot it and post it on your story. And you uh, tag me, uh, a Swedish cellist, Petrona Latrin, or Mastery Music. And then I will give you a thumbs up and a little heart. I would like to end this beautiful little best of or candy bag of interviews with uh, a very special song. It means a lot for me and it's uh, very the very own Martin Rylund who's going to play for us. It is a lament called Nil Gauss Lament and yeah, maybe I should just let him explain what it's all about and then we will listen to it and I thank you so much for listening. See you soon. Thank you. And oh, before we stop, you have to tell us the story about Neil Gao because we're going to listen to Neil Gao's Lament. Yeah. In a few minutes. It's the Neil, uh, Neil Gao's Lament is is uh, I think a very beautiful tune. And there are two stories I'd like to tell about it, actually. Uh, one is that a very good friend of mine that he 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 actually passed away five years ago or something uh, in cancer was uh, he was a Scottish uh, folk singer and he he showed me this tune and played this one to me I mean I don't know ten years ago twelve years ago I don't know and I was totally blown away and I just thought wow my God if if I could ever play that and then. Somehow it just, I did it actually, and it just became kind of mine. But still I own to Alistair Fraser that played this recording. I didn't hear it since then, but uh, that inspiration actually I had from him. So it was mm. a little bit to, to give him that. And then I, I, I played it and I made an arrangement for, for strings also that we played a lot. And yeah. that's why you My asked me, because player. you actually were in the orchestra <laughs> when we recorded it also. Mm. And... Now to the to the story about about the tune itself. Um, it says that, and stories like this have to tend to become better and better. Yeah. But it is a very beautiful story. Mm. That Neil Gao became quite old for the time. This tune is from about eighteen hundred and five, mm. and I think he was around seventy at that time. Now I'm just telling the story by heart, so there might be details, and and. Um, and his first wife has passed away, I think even some of his children, and now even his second wife. And, and so the story tells that, that he, he got what we today would call depressed, simply, and, and stopped playing, and just uh, went around his dark thoughts, until after a long time, friends made him play again. And that the first tune that he played was this melody called Neil Gao's Lament for the Death of His Second Wife. So we are going to listen to that. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mon seul.